it takes a certain type of artist to recognize, hey, this is a movement that represents a certain people. They could really see that they could take genres and, 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 and introduce it to the world. Drake helped to create a sound that is unique to a modern Toronto. But in an attempt to mix things up and broaden his global appeal, he starts to incorporate sounds of the international music scenes. But first, he taps into Toronto's rich cultural history and ties to the Caribbean. I just always was not only proud, but just fascinated with this city, island influence that we have here, you know, with the way people talk, with the way people carry themselves. My Toronto that I grew up in was always what I wanted to put on the forefront if I ever got the chance. Handy your business, one of my favorites. Since Drake has taken off, and become a more of a global superstar. He's had to flirt with and, and experiment with, you know, Caribbean sounds. What's interesting though is that Drake doesn't have any Caribbean background, but OVO sound is all coming from more than 50 years of Jamaican sound system culture. His relationship to the music means he has to grow and familiarize himself with the landscape of sound in Toronto. Toronto is also a place that really endorses reggae music. You know, you white people, the black, the Indian, the Syrian, all are only dance to that Rastafari music. You know, there's a huge Caribbean diaspora in Toronto. There's a rich reggae community that's here. As a kid growing up in the late 80s and mid 90s in Toronto, these were some of the folks that would have been part of the sonic landscape. If you're going to a dance or if you're going to an outdoor event or a party, you might hear a record of a Caribbean artist who's come to Canada that has found a bunch of opportunities. That would be the sound that Drake grows up in and around. Drake was somebody who would hang out up in the Caribbean area and hang out at the barbershops, the restaurants and whatnot. And it's not difficult at all to fall in love with Caribbean culture, learn the language, learn the customs, hear the stories, and all of a sudden, whether you know it or not, you feel as though you are part of the Caribbean family. Marshall Montano is known as the King of Soca. The Trinidadian-born musician has been a pioneer of the genre for over three decades. That beat that is so popular now, that beat that is in, you know, Bieber's, I'm sorry. That beat that is in Drake's One Dance. I need a one dance, got a Hennessy in my hand. Cat, cat. So it's a feeling. Once it comes on, you feel like you're in an island. You feel like you're by the coconut trees. You think like you're on the beach. It's that beat that make you feel like whining. You know, it make you feel like moving your waist. It's really more than a sound. It's a feeling. You don't want to understand what went on with me with One Dance. Whoa, here's Drake embracing Soka, embracing the beat, Caribbean record. But for me, I knew where the sample came from. You know, I was very much a fan of Crazy Cousins who produced this track. You know, so hearing that was kind of like, whoa, this is correct. This is what needs to happen to bring the Caribbean culture out. And a lot of people from the Caribbean, sometimes the initial reaction is, oh, they're stealing our sound, oh, they're stealing our beat. You know, people call it uh, cultural appropriation, all these different things. But for me, I think, you know, there's nothing that belongs to you or belongs to me that doesn't belong to us. And I say, these are some serious times. All I can see around us is just violence and crime. Drake is no stranger to Egyptian. He's singing my first song. It's not like it's to be the popular song on an international level. Yeah, it's a good look, you know? And also show me that Drake is also grounded. Them think Drake is a Rastafari and mega star. Drake are for the people. From definitely.
Despite Drake's success, his use of other genres of music has not always been well received. I think people have rightful concerns about Drake's use of dancehall and like broader West Indian motifs in his music. You have to zoom out a little bit and just think about like infrastructure, racism, the history of migration. I think for a lot of people, the concerns are how does this help Jamaican people? How does this develop the Jamaican music industry, which is vibrant and probably one of the most innovative and ingenious music industries in the world, but still feels, I would say, maybe economically like bound to the island and to the West Indies. It doesn't get the credit it deserves in terms of innovation. I think some of the criticisms people have in regards to Drake is his adoption of the Toronto accent. So that's a mix of diasporas, very Caribbean, specifically like Jamaican influence. Being set to take a dead and chuck your headshot to them ball muscles. You're just going like, oh, this is it's a little bit different. This is not the Drake that we got even like a year ago. That's him trying to grow in a diverse black city. We had to watch him grow into that which, you know, there, there are moments where you're like, ugh, he's on television, he's wearing fake dreads, which I, I'll never appreciate. I couldn't take the TTC, but man's made it over anyway, so I'm excited, dog. <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to grow with the sound of his home city, and he has to become a part of it. I think More Life is the product that comes out of his explorations of him realizing that black music looks differently across the globe and it looks fresh in a bunch of different ways. You can't stay relevant in hip hop without being a vulture. Drake's Caribbean sound brings him more success, but it also brings more criticism. With his next album, the debate around cultural appropriation goes global. Drake's experimentation with diverse sounds comes together on his 2017 album, More Life. Even Drake knows you can't listen to Drake all the time. Drake understood that by that point, the music and the sound that he had begun to pioneer was starting to resonate in England, starting to resonate in West Africa. People are probably listening to him back to back with folks from other countries or even other scenes. So More Life, I'm sure, in essence, began as a business decision and turned it into a smart aesthetic pivot. Drake, because he has a very versatile sound, could do that more than probably most other artists can do that. Drake calls More Life a playlist. The industry dominated now. A quarter of all songs in this week's chart belong to Drake. Billboard 200 chart next week with the biggest debut of any album. Chart records that were at number one on the Billboard 200 albums chart with the biggest debut of 22 More Life songs. Billboard Hot 100 breaking the previous record. And a new one week streaming record. In March 2017, Drake releases More Life. The release continues his streak of consecutive number one albums with seven and breaks Ed Sheeran's single day streaming record on Spotify. Dubbed a playlist, More Life is an attempt to reimagine a record in an era when listeners have abandoned full albums for hand-picked or curated playlists. More Life skips between multiple sounds, Southern rap on the track Portland, Caribbean influences on passion fruit from miles away. and South African house music on Get It Together. You need me to get that sh together. The conversation around Drake's use of global sounds, while not new, comes to a flashpoint with the release of More Life. OVO producer 1985 describes the playlist as an example of Drake being aware of what everyone else is doing musically, then introducing those artists to the rest of the world. Others see it as borrowing from cultures, but giving nothing back. Drake himself told BBC Radio 1 Extra host Tiffany Calver, I'll never understand how supporting somebody's song, or even going a step further, giving somebody a song or linking up, I'll never understand how that's not viewed as something admirable. I guess people have their own outlook on it. Is Drake an elevator or an exploiter of these international music scenes? Or can he be both? I had already heard 
A friend of mine who was a DJ and like DJs for them, Drake like requested, he wanted to hear like nothing but Afro beats. I saw it as a natural extension of being a fan to wanting to like create music with that like flavor. He's always kind of known like this is what people want and how do I adapt myself to this and he's a chameleon that way which just everything he raps in sounds like it fits. I think where Drake does it right is he does his research, but he's saying, I'm gonna work with these artists who are doing what they do already, come in and help me make it more authentic. For us being from like Toronto and also be like Nigerian, when these collaborations happen, we feel that pride like twice. You can't be a rapper that's like big for 10 years or more without being a vulture. You like Jay-Z's a vulture, Kanye's a vulture, they're all vultures. I think everyone is right to have those suspicions, regardless of what his actual intention may be. And I don't think they're sinister, but I don't think they're necessarily altruistic and positive either. I mean, if you spend time with the album, there's growth in there. There's him as an artist, and there's a growth in there around black identity, where he starts to understand how he's positioned in the black musical diaspora as this small little thing in North America that could have all of these connections globally just through sound. I think if we have certain artists who can reach that level and elevate beyond the industry, they could introduce not just the sound, but a host of other artists and be leaders. There's a way to ethically sample and ethically borrow. And when you're a global pop star, the onus is on you. There is more you could do other than featuring them or even just paying royalties. You could also make sure that they get some of the opportunities that you get on a larger scale to ensure that these musics get a greater appreciation globally. With more life helping Drake's sound spread to a global audience, he returns to the southern states. The result is a new approach to collaboration. Q93 is your boy, Wild Wayne. A big day in store. Here comes that beat. New Orleans may be well known for Mardi Gras and jazz, but it's a city that punches above its weight when it comes to music and culture. As the birthplace of Lil Wayne, it also means a lot to Drake, who since early in his career has been tapping into a sound distinct to the city, Bounce. So from this area, this is where like Bounce first kind of started, like with DJ Jimmy and DJ Irv. Like, Bounce is really from a hip-hop template, you know? We just did it our way, and, like, Bounce was kind of a little more raunchy, let's say, and a little more gutter and a little more hood than the New York, and it wasn't so much focused on lyricism as it was a, a mood or a feel or getting a party started. Originating in the projects of New Orleans in the late 80s and 90s, Bounce music proliferated under labels like Birdman's Cash Money. There have been a number of crossover Bounce hits, most notably Juvenile's Back That Ass Up, a song Drake sampled on 2011's Practice. Well, you know, when Drake was initially signed by Lil Wayne and Young Money, it really wasn't a big deal, because Drake wasn't that good yet. And people kind of didn't know, was Drake gonna be big or was this gonna be a one-off here? And we found out he was gonna be big. When Drake decided to lean in to bounce, he turned to one of Nola's finest producers, Black and Mild, the legendary in-house producer for No Limit Records. Drake had played with Bounce before, but he'd never worked with a producer who came up shaping the sound. In 2018, he was tapped to bring in his distinct Nola style to Nice For What and In My Feelings, back-to-back -back number one hits. <laughs> a little something, something, something. 
he just wanted me to implement, you know, what he like about New Orleans, because, you know, he, he done been down here before. He know about, about what's going on. Like how I do down here in New Orleans when I chop up all the bounce, all this vocals or whatever, you know, just to, to make the song hype. You know, and I knew he was gonna like that. You know, he ain't never had his vocals chopped up like that before, so I'm like, I'm gonna give him something a little different. This loop just gotta go into everything. More than any other ingredient, drag rap, known commonly as Trigger Man, by 80s New York rap group The Showboys, forms the basis of bounce music. You can hear the sample in practically every bounce song, such as Lil Wayne's aptly titled Trigger Man, T.I.'s Ball, and more recently, with Drake. It's Drake. He can rap over kicking the snare in his A1. Really, in my mind, I'm like, what does he need me for? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He heard something. And, you know, we just we just really took it to that level. We played the record for him, and I didn't want to look at him. I was like, man, I don't know what to... <laughs> I peeked, and I looked, and I saw him like, all right, all right, we got something. And that was history, man. While Black and Mild provided the production bed for Nice For What, the vocal style originated with bounce pioneers like Big Frida, who appears on the song. But the sound really began with Frida's best friend, Katie Red. Bounce music used to be like, hip hop lyrics with just a different beat. And when I, I started doing it, you know, I separated two different bounce. So now they have a lyrical bounce, and they have shake bounce. Shake bounce is the, shake, 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 shake. You know, like no lyrics at all. Just like take, take up a phrase and just chop it up, chop it up, put a beat to it, and you got a song. This is a certain kind of music. This is what we do off our music. We, we booty shake, we twerk, we do this, we do that, you know. Now since free to have a reality show, she bounces going mainstream. Hey. All right, girl. Oh, all right. Girl. Yeah, let's hope that check don't do what you don't do our music. <laughs> check on bounce, biggity, biggity, bounce, biggity, biggity, bounce. <laughs> the release of Nice for What? It was beneficial because it made other national artists use and dig in the crates to find out about bout samples. So our artists were able to be successful if they were able to get publishing straight on the records that came behind it. Like, Drake is that big of a trendsetter. The people that have the big bucks behind it are gonna follow a trend that works. If Drake learned anything from Nice For What, it was to not stray from a winning formula. He called me back out to Toronto this time for the doing my feelings. Kiki, do you love me? Are you riding? Say you never ever leave from beside me. And I added a lot to it, you know what I'm saying? I added the harder kick, snare, trigger man, breakdown, scratches. Let's go, let's go, let's go! You the only one I love! You on the only day. <laughs> it's like, that's the whole acapella to the, you know, to the original record that me and Magnolia Shorty did. You the only one I love! You on the only day. I can't yeah. Like when Drake said, Kiki, do you love me? I instantly just heard Magnolia Shorty, you the only one I love, as if, as if she was answering him. And when he heard it, he was he was sold. Forty was the one said, this is gonna be big. He he knew. I was like, I don't think this one's gonna be as big as uh, Nice For What. He like, this is gonna be bigger than Nice For What. Like, he told me that before it even happened. So it was, it was just God playing. Around here, it was good and bad. A lot of people felt like, wow, our sound is in the ears of people around the globe now. But then you also had some people who were like, Drake is a culture vulture. Like, I can't believe he jacked their sound. I think it's helping the bounce game, but at the same time, like I said, they're not paying homage to what he did, they pay homage to. But Drake is a Lil Wayne artist. You, you don't think he gonna feed off that? Kiki. If you want me, I was just tired of hearing it. That's our music. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's, that belongs to us. 
Drake being a worldly guy, he he was able to get it. Like, I can just get these random tracks from various people, but for me to reach bigger, like, I'm gonna have to kind of adopt the wave of some of these different areas, whether it be, you know, a rhythm from Caribbean music, whether it be a, a world beat, whether it be a New Orleans beat. He was like, I think I had enough foresight to see, like, yo, if I can get a little bit of these, like, I'll be able to stretch and cover more ground. So it'll be interesting, really, to me, to see what trick bag Drake reaches in for his next big wave. Drake's strategic ability to curate also becomes clear when you look at the talented group of artists he has brought on to tell his visual story. We started from the bottom, and yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Shopper's Drug Mart. We should have done something at Tim Hortons to really round out the full Canadian experience. 